Let's place our design on the cast. The first thing I would do would be to place my mesial rest, distal rest, distal rest. I'm doing this, we're going to have to cut these, so I'm just really scribbling them in real fast to go back and cut on them in a minute. Have a rest here, and we're going to have a rest right in this area here. Okay. Now I need to prep these rests, and I've done a little bit of it to start off just to expedite this. But the first thing I want to look at is I look at my guide plane here. And I want to create a, a parallel guiding plate or a plane parallel to this tooth over here. But I have a very high survey line, and I want that guide plate to be a minimum of 2 millimeters from the marginal ridge. So I want my survey line to be down at least 2 millimeters from the marginal ridge. So before I prepare my rest seat, I'm going to do, do my guide plate first, because if I take enough off at a certain point, um, I might be going into that rest area, and... I'll have to reevaluate how far into that rest I'm going to go. So I have prepped a little bit of a guide plate. I'm trying to lower my survey line from where it was way up here down a minimum of two mil so that metal can glide into that area and help to position the partial denture. Now whether I've achieved what I want, I don't know. I have to go back here because it's kind of hard to tell unless you put it back on that surveyor and now I can see that I have lowered my survey line down at least two millimeters from the marginal ridge so I've taken care of that guiding plate a little bit in that area now because I still have my uh, cast here oriented in the same position now I'm going to take down a millimeter to a millimeter and a half on my marginal ridge now you don't usually have to take down the mesial too much on these molars that have tipped. You'll find that they're actually out of occlusion with the opposing teeth. So I really don't have to lower that too much. In which case if I did, I'd have to lower my um, guiding plate a little bit more. So I want to have a rounded occlusal rest, a spoon-shaped rest, and since my arm is going to go back in this direction, I need a little bit of a sluice way in this area. My rest has to be deeper in this position so that it does not slide off the tooth in that direction. So I think that I have, and I don't want real sharp, deep, steep walls on that rest. So I think I have that one prepared. I'm going to come back here. Now, I don't have any problem with a guiding plate back in this area or uh, a high serving line, so I'm just going to go ahead. Oftentimes you will find, though, that this particular area is really in heavy occlusion with the opposing arch and requires more reduction of the tooth in order to get metal. You've got to have at least a millimeter thick area of metal for this rest minimum of millimeter so that it doesn't break and I have an arm coming up this way my in uh, my um, reciprocal component so I want to have a little bit of a sluice way here to recreate the anatomy of that tooth without making it bulge out and then that arm is going to go in this direction so I'm going to have a bit of a sluice way through here I have to make sure that this point is deeper than my marginal ridge and I have achieved that. All right, on this particular tooth abutment, I have a really high survey line. So again, I'm going to first adjust my, before I cut my rest, I'm going to adjust my, mar my guiding plate, and I'm going to try and lower that guiding plate, say three millimeters down. So that my survey line is down. Now the survey line, the guide plate is usually um, between the two cusp tips. And I'm going to check it to see if I have in fact lowered my survey line. And I have. Now I can go ahead and finish cutting my rest. 
which I had already started doing. I want a millimeter mark taken away at my marginal ridge. I want the fossa to be deeper than the marginal ridge, and I've already taken about a millimeter off of it to expedite things. And I'm going to have plating coming around this way, so I'm going to have a little bit of a sluice way coming this way. And I'm going to have an arm coming in this direction. Now, again, I'm trying to recreate the anatomy of this tooth. I don't want it to be sticking out way back in here, ruining the anatomy area of the denture tooth that I'm putting in. So I'm preparing a bit of a sluice way for the metal arm to come around this way. Now, I need for my arm to end up in the terminal third, which it's going to do. But I'm going to actually alter this a little bit right in here and lower my survey line. And I indicate that at the time I did my survey, I could have indicated it at this point. So I'm going to lower my survey line a little bit right through here. I want it to be above the survey line, but in the middle third of the tooth, preferably. And just check to see if I've lowered my survey line, and I have. So, we'll go ahead and draw this rest in red. Draw the rest in red. I'm going to bring my metal around that rest, my framework around that rest. I'm going to bring this arm. It has to be above the survey line in the first half to two-thirds, and then I will bring it down to my 01 undercut and swing it back up a little bit. It's sort of a J shape. That would be my arm. Now as the arm comes in this direction, it's going to form a guide plate right here. When I circle this rest in this <laughs> direction, this will be my reciprocal component will be plating. The plating should be above the survey line, preferably in the middle third of the tooth. I'm going to have a, a mesial rest. By the time you flare them out to not have steep walls, they get pretty wide. So um, if you start out with them rather narrow, you're better off. Now I'll have a guide plate coming up here. And I'm going to circle my rest with the metal right back through there. Now that will become the top arm of my reciprocal component. Now I notice a little bit of a high survey line right here. So I'm going to lower that just a little bit so that I can keep that arm all above survey line and not have it right on the edge. That's better. So here comes my arm coming through here. The top part of that arm has to be, the arm should be in the middle third because this is our occluding cusp into the central fossa of that upper tooth and it can get in the way. So this top border will become going around the rest. Now it's important for you guys to draw these because it's easy for me to, to watch me. But boy, all of a sudden you have to do it on a test or on a real person. And you, you really can't do it unless you've done a few of these and unless you've really practiced this. So we're going to come down and we're going to grab our .01 undercut right here. And the bottom part of it now swings back. You don't want to scrape on your actual cast that's your final design very much because your, your framework will have some problems. All right, so it comes back and joins and becomes the bottom of our reciprocal component, which again should stay in the middle third of the tooth. So that bottom arm is coming around needs to stay above that survey line and then it comes down as a guide plate right here. So this guide plate came up around, became the top border of our reciprocal component. 
went around the red, became the top border of our direct retainer. Only the terminal third can be below the survey line. And that's about what we have right here. So our arm comes here, it goes back, it becomes the bottom. The bottom comes around, it's the bottom border of the reciprocal component, and it becomes the guide plate here. So we have a guide plate here, and we have a guide plate in two places here. Please note, this direct retainer does not connect to the guide plate. It's a ring class, but it's not a 360 degree ring. It's like one of those cheap bubble gum rings that can flex because it's open. We're going to have base attachment in this area. So we would have the external finish line comes down at this distal lingual line angle of that premolar. It comes down and it keeps enough room to set a tooth in there. And that comes up and joins that guide plate right here on the mesial aspect of that molar. The base is going to come down here like this, and it's going to come forward, and it's going to go down into the depth of our vestibule, and it's going to come back up across our base attachment right there. So that'll give us some guidelines for our base attachment. So this guide plate comes down here, it comes across. <laughs> and it goes back up to the guide plate on this side. There's our guide plate, come down and up. And on the base attachment, we have to have some loops to hold that acrylic tooth in there, so we're going to have some open circles here to help hold that denture tooth into position. Okay, now this guide plate also comes down here and it will become the bottom of our major connector, which needs to be at least five millimeters wide in that area. It comes down to the functional floor of the mouth. Our major connector will swing around here, and it will go down to the functional floor of the mouth, and I see a little frenum attachment right there, so I'm not going to go any lower than that frenum attachment, and it's going to come on back. I'm going to leave that for right now. We had plating here. That plating comes up to and fills that embrasure. It will be in the middle third of the tooth, preferably. It's going to come up and it's going to become the rest right here. Now, I already cut that rest, showing that I have a little bit of a sluice way coming up where the metal can come over the hump of that tooth. Usually, there's not much occlusion in there, so it's not really a big problem. But this point has to be deeper than this ridge here so that the rest does not slide off. So we'll color that in and we'll bring this around. Now our major connector we decided was going to be lingual plating. So the lingual plating covers the cingulum of the tooth and goes up to the embrasure covers the cingulum of the tooth, goes up to the embrasure, and here's where we have a first conflict. If we don't dip down like this, and then go back up on this tooth, we're going to see some ugly metal showing through right here. So this major connector will come up, it will come down right to that point, go back up, cover that cingulum, cover that cingulum, come down, because we got another one of those little openings right here between these two teeth. It will go back up the next tooth, cover the cingulum, go to the contact point, cover the cingulum, and it will become the reciprocal component of this clasp assembly right here. I want to come back over to this other side and 
mark the areas where I did some alteration so that when I get to my patient I'll know where I had to make adjustments. So I usually put the top of the circle at the point where the survey line was, the bottom of the circle right below where I want to move that survey line, and then I put some cross hatches in there. I had to adjust the guiding plate here. So I'm going to again put a circle there, put some cross hatches to indicate that I had to lower that survey line. On the uh, molar, I had to lower this survey line, so I'm going to put a circle right through here. And I actually had to lower it a little farther forward right in this area to get my um, reciprocal component all above survey line. So I'm going to keep that circle going all the way to there and put some cross hatches so that I know that I have to do some alteration of my tooth in that area. As we come over here, we've got to prepare this particular rest right here. And again, I have a very high survey line. So the first thing I want to do is prepare my guiding plane so that I can have parallel guiding planes. And I'm going to lower that survey line preferably to at least three millimeters below marginal ridge. I'm going to resurvey it to make sure that I did achieve that, and I have. And then I'm going to go ahead and cut my rest. You can see that if I had that rest drawn out to here, and if I had already cut it with the deepest part right here, I wouldn't have any positive support, and I'd have to re-alter that tooth, and it would create some problems. My marginal ridge has to come down at least a millimeter. I'm going to have an arm coming out this way, so I want a bit of a sluice way right here on that tooth so that that metal will re, re bring the tooth back to its original shape. And I have plating coming out here, so I'm going to put a little bit of a sluice way in this way. And my rest has to be a positive seat, so this point has to be deeper than my marginal ridge. I think I've achieved it. I'll color in my rest. I have my reciprocal component drawn here. I'm going to have base attachment along in this area, so I'm going to come down. I'm going to come around my rest with the dark pencil. My finish line will come down here. It will come along. I want to put a tooth in at least the size of the missing tooth, and I'm going to come back up to this position. I have a high survey line on my molar, so the first thing would be to prepare my guide plate and my guiding plane. I keep wanting to call that thing a plate but it's a plane on the tooth, it's a plate on the framework. The guide plate usually is between the cusp tips. I'm going to have an arm coming in this direction around here, so I'd like a little bit of a sluice way, and I might lower that survey line just a little bit right there. Have a nice transition for my arm. And on this side, we don't because we're coming around here and our direct retainer is going to end right there. So our rest, lowered at least a millimeter at the marginal ridge, spoon shaped, this point deeper than the marginal ridge. I'm going to go ahead and prep this one too. I have an arm coming this way and it's coming from this direction. I'll have a little sluice way going this way. I want a spoon-shaped rest. No steep walls, so I have to expand this a little bit. And this point deeper than the marginal ridge. Alright, let's go ahead and draw our rest.
we'll go around this rest it's going to come out this side and it's going to come down and join this right here our reciprocal component will come around like this the top border comes like this stays in the middle third of the tooth so as to not interfere with occlusion comes up goes around this rest it stays above the survey this is our, our, our direct retainer so the first two-thirds has to be above the survey line so it's going to come down here it's going to go into our 0.01 undercut And then it's going, the bottom of it will come back this way. Now I'm going to shape that up a little bit. Here again, I wouldn't really want to do that on my master cast. Becomes the bottom border of our reciprocal component on the buckle surface. And again, the reciprocal component has to be all above the survey line and it will join that guide plate right there. There's our reciprocal component coming like this. Comes around, becomes the direct retainer with the bottom one-third of it into the .01 undercut. If I draw my base itself, base will come down here into the depth of the vestibule. It will come back up and cross the ridge. The base will stop and form a nice butt joint at this external finish line. Right above that external finish line. And my major connector will also come down at this point to the functional floor of the mouth and it will come up and join the major connector over here. Now, where the plastic joins the major connector, which is right here, this is the external finish line in brown and our acrylic will butt up against it on the um, tongue side on the tissue side there will be another little butt joint that will be on the major connector itself and that's our internal finish line it's where the acrylic joins the major connector on the tissue side <laughs> our base attachment by coming down from the guide plate area right here and it will come and allow a tooth to be set in that area at least as big as the tooth that replaces and we will have some retentive loops to help hold that in place one more clasp assembly to go um, the guiding plate I think we already prepared it right in this area I'm gonna bring my survey down line down a little bit lower right here so that the first half can be above the survey line and we'll see what we did by resurveying okay that's better lower the marginal ridge a millimeter spoon shaped sluice way coming toward the buckle and kind of toward the lingual too and then the fossa being deeper than the marginal ridge red to indicate the rest tell myself I gotta do that when I get to my patient I have this lingual plate coming forward at the middle third of the tooth 
comes around the rest. <laughs> this part becomes the top border of my direct retainer arm. The direct retainer arm must stay above the survey line at least for the first uh, half to uh, two-thirds. Comes down, grabs that 01 undercut, and swings backward. So my direct retainer is coming like this. You would like it to be kind of J-shaped. It follows the marginal gingiva. It comes down and then it goes back up. But you want it to get that 01 undercut. This is our flexor into the undercut. This is our retentive mechanism. It will only flex so much and the shorter the arm the less it flexes and this is a premolar so it's not very big. So as this arm comes back and, and the bottom part of it comes backward it becomes our guide plate right here and that guide plate becomes our base attachment right in this area. I need to mark the areas that I adjusted which would have been this guide plate so I circle that area and put some cross hatches to indicate that I'm changing that. I adjust the tooth a little bit in this area so I'm going to circle that and put some cross hatches. I did the guide plate on this tooth so I'm going to circle right here and put some cross hatches. The other thing I need to do is I noticed I do not have an internal finish line where the major connector joins the base attachment. I have to have, I have a little external finish line where it joins right here, but also I have an internal finish line where that plastic on the inside of the framework, the, the tissue side, has a little butt joint right there also. So my, my acrylic is going to go something like that. You want to clean these up when you're doing a test on it or when you're doing it on your um, tentative designs for patients so that you remember what you were aiming to do and you can even make yourself some notes like LSL to stand for lower survey line right here. and lower survey line right here and you can even put a GP meaning guide plate same way in this area lower survey line and in this area here lower survey line guide plate and even you've got the red there to know that you need to do this somewhat on the tooth also so these are some of our marks showing us where we need to adjust our tooth, where we have interferences to fit our design rules, which say that direct retainers have to be the first half to two-thirds above the survey line, and reciprocal components have to be entirely above the survey line. The one variation that we didn't cover was when this tooth is a compromised tooth. When this tooth is lost, this partial denture becomes a class 2 um, because it's an extension base on this side. So when it becomes a class 2, we need to think about with our design, even as a class 3, we want to put the type of rest and clasp assembly on here that would go along with an extension base because once this is lost this will depress and this tooth will receive torquing forces. So we have a couple of options on this particular tooth. We have 
a 0.01 midfacial undercut and we have a 0.01 or 2 mid -fa uh, mesial facial undercut. If it's going to become a, an extension base, we don't want to have a direct retainer that is the cast circumferential because that will torque that tooth considerably to the distal. So we want to use one of two ideas. We want to put either a mesial rest, distal guide plate, eye bar on this tooth, the RPI system, and dip down on the lingual, or we want to place a distal rest and plate the lingual at the survey line and put a wrought wire clasp on the mesial facial. Those are two of our systems that will allow for um, being kinder to that tooth from a standpoint of torquing forces. We're going to go ahead with a distal rest and a wrought wire clasp because I've already got that in there, that rest on the distal from our cast circumferential design. So if we want to plan for the loss of that tooth and turning this into an extension base partial, we cannot have our major connector coming back like this because that can't be relined or worked with when the major connector comes back like this. So what we're going to do is end our major connector at the distal lingual line angle of our abutment tooth, our anterior abutment tooth. We're going to end it with an external finish line right here. And we will also have our plastic's going to join here, so we're going to have an internal finish line on that major connector. Now what we're going to do is take this and we're going to swing it up like this and we're going to create base attachment right along here. We're going to bring that base attachment up to this guiding plate right here. We're going to we swung it up. We're going to swing that major connector up. We're going to come and parallel the ridge, come backward, and we're going to come up to this guide plate right here. Then, let's go ahead and draw our acrylic resin, what it's going to look like. Our acrylic resin will come along here right to the functional floor, and it will come like this and it will come across our ridge and it will come down into the vestibule. Now this will be a little bulkier on this side. So the acrylic comes around over the top, comes back down and surrounds the base attachment which is actually a minor connector. We can finish our base attachment by coming down at this guide plate right here, coming across, back up to this guide plate right here, and then open up some holes. for retention in that area. So this is how we would draw it if we're planning for the loss of that tooth. When that tooth is lost, then we have base attachment right here and we can just bring our acrylic and cover retromolar pad and finish off that partial denture and add our tooth in there that's uh, going to be lost. So this is the adaptation and you can see how this is different from the side where the major connector extends backward. This is when the tooth is going to be lost. We do base attachment. This will be bulkier in this area because there will be a space for the base attachment. There will be the base attachment and there will be acrylic on top of it. So that's one of the disadvantages of this. It's bulkier on the lingual to the tongue than if it's solid metal part of the major connector. The last thing that we have to do is add our wrought wire. Now the wrought wire is soldered on the base attachment area.
comes forward. It comes from a distance back here. It comes up the guide plate area and it comes forward and it stays above the survey line. It's drawn as a single line. It comes along the survey line then it goes under the survey line for about half of its length and swings back up to our .02 undercut. Drawn as a single line, comes back here, goes down the guide plate area, and is soldered some distance for flexibility. If we soldered it very close to this point, then the very process of soldering would make that much more brittle and less flexible also. So that's our design planning for the loss using the wrought wire, distal rest, plating, we don't dip down on it, and um, to our major connector. I would not do this type of a, an arrangement if I were doing a test because it doesn't show, unless you note very, very well on the cast, that you're doing this because this tooth is going to be lost. It will appear that you don't understand the rules of class three, which says we can use rigid clasping on our two abutment teeth, the four direct retainers that we will place on that. So I would stick to the other um, technique where you bring your major connector back unless the, the faculty member tells you that that tooth is going to be lost, in which case you would make this adaptation.